All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz. Um, it, forgive just a slight bit of delay. We ran into some tech issues, but I, I'm crossing my fingers. I think we figured them out. You may notice slightly different music. I thought, you know what? We've got the Christmas tree over here. I'm pointing in the right direction. And, um, oh, we already, we're already running into tech issues still. Hold on one second. Okay, we're bringing the guest into the green room. There we go. <laughs> we're going to figure this out. All right. Anyway, continuing on. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, let you all know that if you are streaming live on youtube.com slash book podcast or facebook.com slash book podcast, um, you're going to be able to ask questions of our guests today. So please join in the conversation. Um, if you've got questions or even comments about the topics at hand, we're going to be talking about how to break into the luxury portrait market. It's a really interesting topic. Please don't be shy. Join the conversation. Let's make this a group conversation. And then for those of you that are not streaming live, you're listening to the audio version of this, please go over to youtube.com slash Boca Podcast, subscribe, turn on notifications, and come join the conversations when we do our live streams, usually once or twice a week for the Boca Podcast. Come hang out with us and uh, join in the conversation, add to the conversation with your questions and comments. And um, we would love to have you here. One last note before I introduce my guest, um, I, I want to just remind everybody to take advantage of the opportunity to give back. You'll see on the screen here, if you're live streaming with me, uh, my receipt from today to Charity Water. And uh, Charity Water is the organization that I personally donate to and have for a number of years, but I just want to encourage everybody to take advantage of opportunities to be able to give back, whether it's your local community or national or international organizations, just a little bit of money goes a long way. And especially during the holiday season, I think it's a great thing to, to be encouraged, to be reminded, to look for opportunities to give. So let's all do that together during this holiday season. All right. I am going to, we're going to attempt to do this. I, I lost our guest a couple of times already since we started. So we're going to see if we can make this happen. I want to introduce my guest for today. Brenna, are you there? Can you hear me? Oh no, she's frozen. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll see if we can bring her back in. Everybody hang tight here. We, we've been running some connection issues and, and I don't know if this is somehow tied to the outage with Amazon Web Services today. Um, but we're going to try one more time to being, bring Brenna back on. And if we can't make that happen, then we'll just reschedule this episode for a different day. Uh, for those of you that are streaming live with us, we actually have a good number that have joined us today. And I appreciate you being here. Every once in a while, we run into technical issues with connection. And um, so let's see if we can't fix this. Brenna is trying to call in. Give me one second. All right, Brenna, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh my goodness. Okay. We're so gonna... sorry. I don't know what is going on. <laughs> I'm here. You're here. Oh, okay. And I'm I can here. hear you we'll and I can see you. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. You're not goodness. pixelated. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to try this. Don't anybody move or change anything or do anything. <laughs> <laughs> we will pray for a Christmas miracle. That's going to happen today. <laughs> Let's do that. Well, and if for some reason something goes awry with the connection, we can always move it to a different day if we need to, but we're going to try to make this happen. And I appreciate, we've got a yes. number of people already streaming live with us. I appreciate you Yay. all joining us. And I want to introduce you to Brenna, Brenna Heater. Brenna, thank you so much for making time for the Boca podcast today. We're going to be talking yes. about a big topic in luxury portrait photography too. Yes, we are. And I'm really excited to tackle this with you. It's a, yeah, it's a pretty loaded topic. And we're going to get into some of the nuance of that here in just a few minutes. But normally I start with some introductory questions with our guests. And the first one that I normally jump to has to do with brand position. So I'm curious as a portrait photographer, and you're based in Arizona. Whereabouts in Arizona? I am. I live in Tempe, but I market myself toward the Scottsdale area. Okay, cool. So in the Scottsdale area there, what is your photography business's brand position? Sure. Well, I say that I am a luxury maternity and newborn photographer based in Scottsdale, and I am also an educator. And my focus is on helping busy moms, whether it's a client who wants my photography portrait services or a student who's also a busy mom building a, a photography business. Okay. So I, I want to jump back to the photography side of it. And as we're talking about this, I'm going to bring up your website. So anybody listening in or watching or streaming live, any, any bit of it, if you go to Brenna, B-R-E-N-N-A-H-E-A-T-E-R, brennaheater.com. And of course, we'll link to this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Side note, 
Same thing on Instagram, Brenna Heater. And um, you can check out Brenna's work there as well. But Brenna, when, when I jump there to your photography website, the, the work is beautiful and it kind of speaks for itself. Uh, but we all know that we've got to be more than just really great photographers at the end of the day in order to stand out. And so you talked about the significance of a, being a luxury photographer. We're going to talk about what that means and how you got there in a bit. But as a brand position statement, is that, is that pretty unique for that area? Most photographers don't speak to that specifically. Yes, I think it is. You see a lot of luxury wedding photographers, but not so many luxury portrait photographers or those that market themselves as a luxury. And so I want to come across from the very beginning that it's the complete experience from start to finish that the clients are going to receive when they book with me. Got it. Well, and, and by the way, beautiful setup to my next question, because we're going to talk about what luxury actually means. There's that word gets thrown around a lot in the industry. So we'll talk about that in just mm -hmm. a little bit. But when you talk about experience and customer experience, it's a it's a significant part of providing a luxury brand or demonstrating yeah. a luxury brand to the marketplace. What drives that client experience for you? What do you think is one of the most important components of that client experience for your business? I would say setting expectations and being very clear from the start. I want my clients to feel comfortable and confident and prepared every step of the way. And that's on me to fully communicate with them so they know exactly what to expect when we show up for their maternity session on location or when I arrive to their home for the newborn session. They know the timeline, they know the order of the photos that I'm gonna take and when I'm gonna be done so they can make plans or get some rest, especially if they have a newborn in the home. And then jumping to my next question, uh, we talk about time management. I know it's a, kind of a big jump. We're talking about client experience and time <laughs> management, but as business owners, one of the most challenging components of running a business is kind of balancing our business with our personal lives. And I know that word balance looks different for different people, but uh, when I jump over to your website, I'm going to pull your website up here again. And again, for those of you listening in or streaming, brennaheater.com. Um, in, in the meet Brenna section, you've got this beautiful picture of you with your kids talking about mom They're so life. Cute. <laughs> They're absolutely adorable. And, um, I'm just curious, like with that is, is kind of the point of conversation. What would you say is the most important principle that drives your ability to manage time, balancing family life with running a business? Yeah, so I'm not only a mom, but I'm a homeschool mom. So my husband and I decided when our our oldest was ready to start school, we weren't ready to send him off. And we prayed about it a lot. And we just really felt like the Lord was leading us to keep our kids home and be their educators. So that is my priority. So when balancing home life and business life, my goal is number one, my kiddos education. So setting up a schedule that works for us to be able to focus on school first in the morning. And then I have my office hours in the afternoon. I have a virtual okay. assistant who helps. I have an editor. I outsource as needed. But for us, it was like really schedule, uh, setting up that schedule that worked mm -hmm. best for us and also appropriate business boundaries. So I know we could spend endless amounts of time talking about this, but I have to jump into this just a little bit. You talk about the significance of schedule and, yeah. um, I, I find it fascinating, both in my personal life, business life, conversations with personal friends or maybe even family, certainly photographers in the industry. When it comes to the idea of schedule, it's, it's fascinating to me how hard a time people seem to have committing to even just like a time on a calendar, putting right. something in their calendar and committing to that. I don't know if it's a commitment thing. I don't know if it's like a FOMO thing. If I put this in my calendar, then I might miss this thing. I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I treat my calendar like absolute truth. Like that thing is in the calendar. Yes. That it's going to happen. I will be there. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and hopefully even a few minutes early. So I know I'm a yes. bit of an extremist in some ways, but I also am a little bit confused at times why that's so complicated for so many people. For you, having a lot to juggle, still making that commitment to the calendar, is there something that enables that or makes it... I guess, easier to manage and to make that commitment? I would say having a shooting limit 
and sticking to it. You know, I don't like to overwhelm my shooting schedule because then I overwhelm every other part of my schedule, right? I have an editor, so she's able to handle my editing for me. But if you don't have an editor and you're overwhelming your shooting schedule, then you're overwhelming your editing schedule. And that is, you know, we could, I know you and I could go on and on about the importance of outsourcing your editing sure. because it is amazing the time you get back with the little expense that you put in. Um, but yeah, I, I realized that for me, I only take about three to four babies per month. So my goal is maybe one newborn a week. And if I have one newborn or three newborns a month, rather, like I feel really comfortable with that. I'm able to spend that homeschool time with my kids without overwhelming and being gone every single day to shoot a session. Yeah. And, and it seems like the driving principle there then is just not taking on more than you can effectively handle, right? I, I know, well, yeah. Um, and, and I can say this because I'm guilty of it. Even now I'm like, have I taken on too much? We've got a lot of different brands and, and so many different moving parts yeah. associated with these various brands and trying to get them launched and so forth. And I, at the end of the day, what I've tried to be about anyway for years now, as far as the brands that I've created and, and how I live my life, how I engage with my kids is to make sure that work doesn't take over my life so that I have the space for my kids, first of all, and then Absolutely. other important relationships in my life. The last thing we want to do is compromise that under the guise of work, but um, it can be challenging at times. We have to be super intentional about that. And I love that you're doing that. You talked about outsourcing and this is a really, or just delegation as a general principle is super yeah. important when it comes to time management. Will you talk just briefly about what you're delegating in your business life in order to, to help you manage your time more effectively? Yes, I have, I would say four of my favorites, three. Ooh, maybe, no, I just added another one. So I have a private editor. I have a virtual assistant who okay. helps with blogging. And then with my education side of my business, she handles all of my student support emails, tech emails, um, my courses and my membership are inside Kajabi. So she helps with that show it, you know, so many things. So my VA is amazing. I have a Pinterest strategist. And then within the last few months, I also just hired a Facebook as marketing company. So they're helping me with launches and marketing. But on the personal side, I am a huge fan of outsourcing my meal prep. <laughs> so I really? use Home okay. Chef and we have used that for over over a year, we get three meals delivered every week mm. for myself and my family. I pick out the, the meals. It gets delivered in a box, in a kit with the recipes to our home. I love cooking. I don't love planning to cook. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that has been such a savior to our household and has made dinner time so much easier in the last year. So highly recommend Home Chef or any uh, meal prep delivery service. It's wonderful. Well, we've got a question. By the way, we, we've got a bunch of people streaming with us. Y'all don't be shy. Hello. Ask questions, comment, yes, join in the conversation. Do. But Casey from Facebook says, how did you go about finding your virtual assistant, especially someone that you trust with your business? Oh, such a great question. So I use Flowdesk for email marketing. And lo and behold, I was just in the Flowdesk Facebook group one day and uh, somebody else had asked about a virtual assistant. And of course, I'm like, I'm going to sleuth in and see who, uh, who I can find. <laughs> and so somebody, Katie, commented and she uses all of my platforms. She was already familiar with 17 Hats and Flowdesk and Kajabi and WordPress. And I was like, oh my gosh, she sounds amazing. And so I've been working with her for a about a year, maybe a little over a year now, and she's wonderful. So that is an option. Um, I've also heard really great things about outsourcingwithlove.com, okay. where it's a compilation of a bunch of different online services and business owners that you can reach out to and ask for help. That's brilliant. And and Casey, thanks for the question. And everybody else listening, yeah, in, don't hesitate to continue to ask questions. We're going to be getting into a really big topic and luxury, getting into the luxury portrait market. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. One quick follow-up question. And again, I know we could spend a lot of time here. We'll try to keep it brief. You Delegation, you've, you've kind of owned this concept of delegation in your business, it seems. You've delegated in different ways. One of the most challenging components of delegating is communication. And, and I, again, say this from personal experience, even now having been a company owner for 13 years or so with photographers at it and working with other brands as well, learning how to effectively communicate to your team, managing their expectations, learning how to communicate to individual personalities that differ from person to person, 
um, understanding how those people receive the words that I say, how they prefer to communicate as far as their communication style. There's so many components to this communication piece. Is there an idea or two that you could recommend to our listeners that they embrace when it comes to better communicating for a better experience with delegation? Well, I'm definitely not an expert on this. I honestly don't feel like I'm the best manager or delegator. I do not like uh, conflict or any any kind of complaining that is not me. Um, so when it comes to communicating, I would say be you and be yourself, but also remember that your team wants to help you. That's their job. They want to fulfill the needs of that you hired them for. So if something's not going right, you can say that in a way that is kind and respectful and they want to fix it. They want to get it right. Well, and I actually read, I've been in the process very slowly of reading a book called Business Made Simple. Donald Miller is a, an author we talk a lot about here on the podcast. He wrote Building a Story Brand. Have you read that before, Brenna? Ooh, no, I haven't. Oh, I'm going to have to get you a copy of that then. We'll, we'll, we'll do, do that. But um, he wrote a, a series of books. One of them is called Business Made Simple. And I, and I just highlighted this the other day in the book, actually, because, again, this is something that I'm, I know I need to continue to do better at. Um, he says, a good manager acts like a coach. They explain the rules of the game to their team and give them specific instructions about how to perform better and win the game. A manager who simply cheers their team on is not a coach. They are a cheerleader. Coaches design plays, give specific instructions, and collaborate with their team to create strategies that lead to victory. And I just really appreciate that because it, it, very simply, it speaks to specificity, right? Understanding very clearly what it is that you want the person that you're delegating to, to do make sure that you proactively manage those expectations so they understand what it is they're trying to achieve and reach toward. And now there's actually a collaborative effort to get somewhere versus just kind of like unloading whatever it is that you want somebody else to do onto them and walking away and hoping they get it done right. Yes. There's a difference in yes. that experience. So true. I love that idea of being a coach and not just the manager or the yeah. cheerleader. Yep. I liked that picture. Anyway, we'll link to that book in the show notes. But speaking yeah. of books, actually, I want to ask you for a book recommendation, self-help book, yes. business book, a favorite of yours? Yes. So I have not finished it yet. I just started reading it this month, but it's called How to Never Lose a Customer Again by Joey Coleman. Okay. And it's amazing. It speaks to business owners of any kind of business, whether you're a business to business or a business to human or business to person offering, it, it boils down to the reason you could lose a customer is that the customer feels neglected after the sale. And it, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, but that's the, the goal from here on out is to learn how to continue that relationship with the customer after that sale is made. Oh, and I think we just lost Brenna. Um, while hopefully she's able to call back in, I, those of you who are live streaming um, may be able to see this on the screen. For those of you listening to the audio, Never Lose a Customer Again is the book that Brenna was mentioning. Turn any sale into lifelong loyalty in 100 days. And uh, we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. Sounds like uh, Brenna is trying to call back in. So we'll see if we can add her to the call. One second here. We'll bring her in, push the right button. There she is. Brenna, you're there. There we go. So sorry. I'm here. I'm back. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Well, I was, as you were um, taking a little mini break there, I was sharing <laughs> my screen with listeners and brought up this book, Never Lose a Customer Again, yes. Turn Any Sale into Lifelong Loyalty in 100 Days. That's the book, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. So we'll link to that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. By the way, this is something I don't mention enough, but there is a resource for everybody listening, bocabookshelf.com. If you go to that URL, you'll see some of the favorite books mentioned on the Boca Podcast. Uh, if you're ever looking for a, a reading resource, in fact, Brenna, if you're ever looking for a book, go check it out too. It's a really great resource. I will. Thank you. Cool. So, such a great resource. I love that. Well, so let's let's just keep the conversation going. We're going to jump into kind of our primary topic. Maybe before you get cut off again, <laughs> we can yes. we can get through the conversation. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, the term luxury, we're going to talk about how to get into luxury portrait photography today and then that market specifically. But the, the term luxury has gotten thrown around quite a bit in our industry over the years. 
and of course, I understand why. I mean, it's 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 almost like clickbait, right? It's something that grabs our attention. We're like, ooh, luxury, something really fancy, and yes. I make a lot of money, yeah. and that's cool. <laughs> but I think because it's been used so much, maybe it's watered down the definition or even confused the the potential definition of that word. How do you define luxury as it relates to portrait photography? I liken it to the difference between Target and Neiman Marcus, for example. When you walk into Target, you're not going to get a personal greeting. You're not going to have somebody show you to the department that you're looking for. You're not going to have somebody bring you new sizes or new items when you're trying things on in the dressing room, but you're going to get all of that stuff at Neiman Marcus. It's a start, beginning to end process of assistance. It's working with the client as a photographer to guide them and show them exactly the service that I offer that meets their needs and working with them to educate them on why I do things the way that I do and how it could benefit them. Luxury doesn't always have to mean a huge price tag. It really focuses more on the service that you provide and typically a luxury service provider will cost more money because we see the value in what we, what we do and we want to focus on uh, quality over quantity. And that's a big part of what I want to offer as well. Okay. So I wrote down, and I'm literally taking notes here. If you see me look down at some point, I, I've got a <laughs> notebook here. I'm taking notes. So I just wrote down the word experience and I circled it because it, and yeah. you actually brought this up earlier. It seems as though your, your brand when we're talking about this concept of luxury, your brand is centered around or has been built around this experience, this incredible experience that you give your clients. I'm curious to dig into what that looks like here in just a little bit. But before I do, um, I don't know, let me push back just a little bit. So when we talk about price point as it relates to luxury, because I think a lot of photographers, when they hear luxury, they immediately think price point, right? Sure. Um, and in order to charge a premium, and, and I was looking at your prices and they are a premium for sure uh, when it comes to portrait photography. There, you automatically kind of filter out a massive segment of the market. You're, work, you're looking for right. a particular target demo. Do you have a definition for yourself internally, even if it's not something that you're focused on the majority of the time? I realize the experience is, is the most significant, but do you have kind of a price range in mind when you're looking at yourself in contrast to maybe your competition saying, I'm in the luxury segment and this group of people over here are not? Of course, we're not mm -hmm. criticizing them. That's just, they're charging yeah. a different price point. Is there a range that you have in mind? The, the number that typically comes to my mind is a minimum of $500 is going to get you into that luxury price range. These are clients who are willing to invest and also uh, not only will, in, will be willing and able to invest in the photography, but are able to invest in the other things that come along with it, right? Like the hair and makeup. And I'll give you a good example. When I priced, uh, I had maternity sessions years ago, I would have one new maternity session at $300 and let's say it was a 45 minute session. I had another maternity session available for 450 and it was a longer session and included more outfit changes. But I found that because I, when I was offering both, most of my clients would only book that $300 package because it was available. And I was kind of sick of it. <laughs> I was like, I want to charge the 450. So that's all I'm going to charge now. However, once I took away that $300 maternity session and was only charging or only was offering that 450 session, my clients at that price point were still not able to afford the professional hair and makeup and the the clothing they were showing up in really inexpensive gowns that didn't photograph as well mm. and uh and they were splurging and or, you know saving so much and spending the 450 on their maternity session that there was no money left over for the extras okay and i was like what, what am i doing you know what can i do to help the client you know, look great for their photos because that's the goal. They're, they're spending the money, their hard earned money on these images. And I want them to love them. I want them to feel amazing and look amazing and invest in the whole package. So that's usually, that's about the time that I started investing in buying a client closet. And when we talk about the six steps to offering luxury portraits, that's definitely one of them. And I'll dive more into the client closet, but that's just basically a collection of dresses that I have that my clients can use at no cost. And I know they're going to photograph well and look beautiful on camera and help the clients look great too. 
Well, and, and I jumped back over to your website. And again, for anybody listening in or watching, Brenna, B-R-E-N-N-A, heater, H-E-A-T-E-R dot com slash details. And right there, front and center. Yep. Um, maternity and newborn collections begin at 1250. So definitely charging a, a premium, but I, it's interesting to me. And, you know, when we talk about pricing and we just did recently, actually, we talk about on a practical level, building a price point, which is reflective of our financial needs and goals, right? A lot of photographers, Absolutely. I think kind of tend to overcomplicate the pricing process, looking at just doing this comparative analysis. Um, and I, and I say that lightly of their competition and just kind of basing their prices on that versus what it is that they're yeah. actually need to and want to accomplish financially. So there's that component of it, but then something interesting that you've done is you've established the experience internally. Anyway, the, the experience that you want to give to the client and you realize in order to give them that experience, you've got to start at a minimum of, in this case, 1250, at a certain price point in order to deliver yeah. that experience, which is also reflective of this premium brand that you're trying to develop. So I think it's an interesting combination. And Stephanie on Facebook uh, commented, she says, I love this definition of luxury because it doesn't sound stuffy or uptight. And and, yeah. it's, and you're right, very accessible in the sense that we're not, we're not categorizing people based on how much they make. We're talking about an no. experience and wanting to deliver a particular experience if people want that experience, yes. here is the premium. And naturally that's gonna filter out certain people, but yep. the experience is what the focus, the, the, excuse me, the focus of conversation is the experience. Absolutely, and I love, I love your comment, Stephanie, because you're so right. It's not about the, what, the job that the client has or how much they make. I have photographed in multi-million dollar homes and doctors, attorneys, uh, nurses, you know, the, the, the whole gamut of those higher end, well, more well-paying uh, vocations. But I've photographed families that are just like me who, you know, middle class and not super luxury, not super wealthy, uh, but value the photography and are willing to put that investment in. And every client no matter where they come from, they hired you for a reason and they deserve that same incredible experience with you. So what was the motivation for you then, Brenna, to get into this segment of the market? Because as I've said so many times on the podcast before, as much as we talk about the luxury market in the industry, the reality is the majority of the market isn't in that space. So you're, you're choosing Correct. to get into a market, a segment of the market to target a particular demographic, which is much smaller what was the intention behind that choice? Well, when I started photography in about 2013, I, I photographed everything except for weddings. I was really never interested in shooting weddings. Okay. Uh, but I did baby showers. I did first birthday parties and I tried it. I didn't love everything. Over the years, I really realized that the moms and the babies are what I loved serving. But I also did not want to work full-time hours. And like we mentioned earlier, I'm a homeschool mom and my priority was to stay home with my kids and have a part-time business on, on the side, right? It was always a legit business, um, but I didn't ever want to work full-time hours. And I started getting the burnout and did not want to serve hundreds and hundreds of clients a year. That was not my desire. It wasn't my intention. And I realized I can make more and serve fewer clients, mm. serve them very well, sure. and and work from a place of gratitude and rest as a as opposed to working from a place of go 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 and and be busy all the time and hustle all the time. I didn't want to work from that place. What are the? I want to talk about your recommendations to photographers if they're considering maybe they're kind of a crossroads and they're trying to decide whether or not to go this direction or this direction. We'll go the luxury market or maybe serve the other remaining segment or segments of the market. Um, trying to make that decision. I'd love to get your take, your advice, your recommendations in that regard. But before we do that, are there any potential drawbacks to focusing on the higher end segment of the marketplace? What are the challenges therein? You're going to have a more, I would say fewer competition, to be honest with you, because as you're as your prices go up, fewer people will be able to afford you, right? Uh, but then you're not going to be able to get 
all of those, the inquiries that you might be used to, you know, I probably only get three to five inquiries a week and that's on a good week. Wow. And it took me a little while to uh, like not freak out about that, yeah, yeah. but that's a good thing because I had to remind myself, I don't want to be the photographer for everyone. I don't want to shoot five babies a week. That's exhausting to me. And I don't want to be at a, or offer a disservice to my clients by working too much and not giving a hundred percent. So be aware that, you know, the inquiries are going to slow down, but to be honest with you, in my experience, luxury clients are a lot easier to work with. They're less picky. They're more trusting because especially when mm. you market yourself as an expert in your mm -hmm. field, mm -hmm. they trust you for that. Right. I cannot tell you how many times my clients should say, Oh, just bring some dresses for me. I trust you. Just pick it oh, this looks great. You're amazing. You know what you're doing. It's, it's so wonderful and so relieving to just feel so trusted. And it's really an honor when my clients are able to believe me and trust me. And it, it's wonderful. Yeah, there, it is a fascinating experience. When I shot my first wedding for $350 and then we worked up to, to shooting $10,000 weddings Yes, uh, per client. And so you do have that range of experiences working with different demographics, but you're right. As you move into a higher end segment, you're working with people who have money or are used to just handing over money for the sake in exchange for a service. Um, they're used to trusting, as you pointed out, somebody else to take care of you. And that yeah. is, that is quite an incredible experience to be able to work with people who are just like, here's the money, do your thing. We trust yeah. you. And, and that's it. It keeps it really, really simple. Yeah. Exactly. So there are advantages, I guess, in that sense, into getting into this segment of the market, certainly the time advantage shooting less, making more for mm -hmm. or for less sessions. But um, are there any other suggestions, ideas I, that, that you would recommend that photographers listening in or watching would keep in mind as they're going into the luxury market? Any any I mean, any additional drawbacks or potentially benefits? Uh, why you would even say, hey, so, you know what? You should go for it. Yeah. Well, first, I would say. Focus on your experience, your client experience first. Even if you're not charging that luxury price point quite yet, you can still offer a luxury service to every single client as you work up the courage and the confidence to start increasing your rates and really uh, reaching that high end 500, 700,000 plus price point for your clients. And also figure out how what do you want to offer? You know, we're going to get into these six steps to starting your luxury photography business, but not all of them are going to be for everyone. I don't even follow all six of them. So really figure out what works best for you and your business and how much time do you want to put into it? And I think that being very clear about what it is that we're trying to accomplish as business owners enables us then to choose what of those six steps that you're going to share make are a good fit right for the model that we're trying yes. to develop again a lot of confusion i think comes from lack of clarity on our part as individuals i am i'm an individual human being this is what i'm trying to get out of life i am then going to build a business that helps support those personal goals and this business model should enable me to get there and then based on that model that i'm building now i can choose obviously the target client and what i'm charging the demographic that i'm that i'm wanting to serve and how i'm going about serving them and on and on and on but if i start in a place of clarity being very very clear about what it is that i'm trying to accomplish with this business that helps us be able to filter and be, be able to make those decisions more effectively so i, I think that's something Absolutely. important to keep in mind for everybody and lisette is commenting on facebook she says i love this idea but i don't own a studio would this work for me Girl, I do not own a studio either. So it <laughs> is okay. Absolutely. So I, I focus myself on being an in-home photographer. At the luxury price point, you're going to have clients who have luxury homes and who put pride into their homes, right? They're going to design, for, for my example, I'm a newborn photographer. So they're going to design a beautiful nursery that they want beautiful photos of. So a huge majority of my sessions take place in the client's home. If the clients uh, are renting a home or an apartment, or their home just isn't painted the way they want, or they, it's not decorated the way they want, or there's not enough light, or they just don't want to clean up their house. Awesome. I have access to a studio that I love to rent, and I pass that cost on to the client. So they pay for that studio option. But absolutely, you do not have to have a studio to be a luxury photographer. 
Okay. Well, that's, that's encouraging. And Lisette, thank you for asking that question Great again. For question. those of you that are still stream, streaming, please don't hesitate. YouTube, Facebook, ask questions, join the conversation. Let's get to those kind of six primary steps. Um, Brenna, if you don't mind, that would enable a photographer to get into this luxury portrait market. Absolutely. So the first one, and we've touched on this a lot already, is your client experience. But not only, you know, the, the umbrella of the client experience, I want you to get out and sit down with a pen and a paper and a pen and a pad of paper and really write out every single touch point that you have with your clients from first inquiry to final gallery delivery, everything in between. So do you send your pricing with a, a website? hidden page or a PDF? And do you then send the contract and the invoice and your style guide and all of the communication that you have with a client once they book with you? Write that down on paper. We wanna get things automated so nothing slips through the cracks. I use 17 hats to automate my client uh, process and workflow and that's incredible. Okay. Uh, but also, which is going to lead me to the second Point, which is client gifting. You've got to start incorporating gifts into your client experience. And this is really a non-negotiable once you reach that luxury price, uh, price point for your, for your clients. A good rule of thumb is to spend 5% on what your client pays you toward a gift. So let's say your session is $1,000. 5% of that is 50 bucks, right? It's not that much. And you can send a personalized gift. You can send a gift box. For me, when a client books a collection with me, so a collection is both maternity and newborn sessions, uh, I send a custom gift box that I create from Shop Box Fox. And I just did it, sent out a couple yesterday, okay. surprise to those clients who are gonna get them. But that's a booking, it's a welcoming gift. And my clients are blown away when they receive this sweet gift in the mail. And, um, and then I have a couple other gifting processes throughout the entire client experience. And that 100% sets me apart from any other photographer, because I can guarantee you if we had 100 photographers raise their hand right now, maybe one or two of them would be actually would be sending gifts as part of their client experience. So it's not very common, but I feel like it needs to be. Well, and I'm, I'm jumped over to it's shopboxfox.com, yes. just like it sounds. Um, I just pulled this up really quickly. Yep. I hadn't seen the site before. And now I'm very curious. I've bookmarked it. I'm going to have to take a look at it. And we'll certainly link to this in the uh, the show notes of Book of Podcast. It's amazing. Yeah, it looks amazing too. And and I would assume yes, too. Yes, and I have a if I don't know. If, oh. I was going to say I have a referral link too. So if people want are interested, I you can get I think ten dollars off your first box of seventy five dollars if you use a, a special referral link. Okay, cool. Well, maybe we can put that in the show notes then for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and you can you can take advantage of that. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm by the way, again, I'm taking notes. So just looking at my notebook <laughs> here, first step, build a luxury client experience. And yes. some might say, well, but that's kind of obvious, right? But I, I actually like this um, as an exercise when you're talking about considering all the touch points, literally listing yes. them out and then yes. thinking about how you can up the ante with each and every one of those touch points. It could be sometimes it could be something small. It doesn't cost a lot of money but you're changing this experience for the sake of, of luxury, giving the appearance, the, the experience of luxury. Yes, so exactly. I think, I think that's important. Incorporate gifting. This is something that we did with, with our clients as well. We actually kind of partnered with a local uh, gift shop, a uh, boutique, a uh, beautiful, beautiful little shop. And we were, there were certain gifts that we really liked. So we buy, buy them from the shop and package them and give them to our clients. And, and, it's so cool to be able to do this. We actually did this in person and yes. to be able to, like, they don't expect anything. They, they just put a exactly. down payment on, on, you know, a wedding package, for example, and they're spending a lot of money, yep. but I literally hand them this bag with these gifts in it. And they're almost like, what is this? They're not expecting yep. it. And it's cool. It really makes an impact. So I think that's a great recommendation. It really does. Absolutely. I also send a little gift box to previous clients who send me new clients. I have a mm. couple of clients who are my hype girls and they send me to everyone. And I appreciate that. So in, I know some photographers do maybe a referral program where they get money back if they send clients. I just prefer to send them a sweet gift like a Target or Starbucks gift card with a gift box and you know something small. It could be an e-gift card. You don't mm -hmm. have to spend money on shipping, for example. Mm -hmm. um, 
Maybe if you are an engagement photographer or an anniversary photographer, you gift the clients a $50 gift card so they can go out on a date the evening of their session since they're all dressed up and they have hair and makeup done. You know, it doesn't have to take you a ton of time. It's really the, the thought behind the action that keeps the client happy and keeps you at the front of their mind. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I'm still kind of amazed when I get a surprise gift in the mail. It, it's, I don't know, it makes you feel good because it's totally unexpected. Yes, so it you're totally right. it totally does. And I'm not like a, a, a gifts person, right? So if we talk about the five love languages, yeah. gifts is like the bottom of the totem sure. pole for me. Yeah. But who does not love getting a surprise, thoughtful, custom gift in the mail? Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who doesn't love that. It's brilliant. No, I, I still, I'm 42. I must, I might as well be a 14 year old when I get these little gifts. I'm like, Oh, this is so fun. I totally didn't expect it. It is. It okay. Is. So we it got those first, so special. there's first yes. couple steps. Let's jump to number three, if you will. Yes. Number three. And I touched on this earlier is start a client closet. This by far was the turning point in my business. When I started collecting dresses for my maternity and postpartum, the newborn mamas to use for their sessions at no cost. This is built into the session fee. And this was a game changer. It took a little while to snowball and get the clients comfortable wearing somebody else's dress, so to speak. But this is hands down the number one reason I hear that most of my clients book with me. I have a, a, a closet of about 40 ish dresses. And they're, you know, the turnover is good. If, clients aren't buying or uh, selecting dresses to wear, I'm going to sell them and I'll get new ones depending on the style, the season, what the clients really want to see and what they want to wear. Okay. But a hundred percent, the client closet is a game changer. Well, and shout out by the way, to Stephanie Cole, who was on our podcast a few episodes ago, 518, uh, Stephanie talked about differentiation through client experience. She mentioned the client closet. Uh, do you have a, a particular resource, if you don't mind sharing, or resources that you go to for clothes to build out that closet? Yeah, one of my favorites is Baltic Born, and they are not very expensive dresses by any means. Most of them, I would say, are under $100. I do have a blog post, and I can include the link for you so everybody can learn more about how to start a client closet, if that's something that they're interested in. Um, that's one of my most popular blog posts, and I also have a, a separate lesson inside my membership for motherhood photographers where we dive even deeper into how to start a client closet and it is just a wonderful wonderful resource so i love baltic porn i love free people um and yeah those are the two off the top of my head that their dresses i i love them and for me especially as a maternity and newborn photographer right i need to get dresses that are stretchy that are able to fit multiple sizes and still look great on camera and I've pulled these both up here for those of you who might be listening or streaming free people.com as in F R E E and then Baltic born B A L T I C B O R N.com. And we'll link to those in the show notes as well. Lots of resources today. This is, this is really great. Brenna. So many. Yay. So starting a client closet, do you, do you, how do you go about choosing the style of clothing? Uh, I mean, it, these, both of these websites kind of speak for themselves as far as the style that you're looking at, but yeah, it, it seems like it might be kind of difficult to consider everybody's tastes and making sure that you've got something for everybody. And then you're also having to consider sizes. How, how do you go about that process? Well, for me, as a film inspired light and airy photographer, I first look for lighter colors, the uh, lighter colors, pastels, white creams, those just uh, flatter my photography and complement my photography style first and foremost. So that's the number one thing that I look for. The, the number two thing I typically look for when buying dresses is, does it cover the mom's arms? That is typically a point of self-consciousness for pregnant or postpartum mamas and have the arms covered. I do have a handful of dresses that are sleeveless and some moms choose those, but 
for the most part, I'm looking for flowy fabric. I don't want okay. something too clingy. Yep. I want um, something that's washable. <laughs> I don't want to have to take dresses to the dry cleaner every week. I want to be able to wash it at home and take care of it at home. Sure. I have a uh, an industrial or you know a full size steamer that I'll have steaming parties once a week. I'll wash all the dresses that were worn in the week and then steam them and get them ready for <laughs> the next client. What is a steaming? It's just like drinking and steaming at the same time. Is that oh, a steaming? Oh, <laughs> oh, I would not trust myself with a glass of red wine while I was working <laughs> with dresses. No, like a favorite movie like, in the background, some music totally. playing. Okay. Yes. Dancing bad, while you're um, steaming. Reality TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. All right. So number three, starting a client closet. Take us to number four, if you will. Okay. Number four is start offering albums. I use and I love Kiss Books. I've never used any other album company, so I can't recommend any other company. But when you start offering albums to your clients, it again, it gives you a leg up because you're able to design the album for them and have it complement a wedding album, right? Most luxury maternity or newborn clients are also or were also previously a luxury wedding client, and they may have an album that goes along with that. So designing a newborn album to, to complement their home and last have those images last forever is a key. Oh, okay. You're, you're back with us. We, we lost you there for just a second, Brenna. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. I promise I won't like take screenshots of what your face looked like while it was frozen and spread them on the internet. <laughs> you know what? I wouldn't blame you if you had totally my fault. <laughs> I'm totally playing with you. Um, no, I just wanted to make sure you were there, but you mentioned mentioned Kiss and uh, Kiss. Yes. Sean Austin's the CEO over at Kiss. I was just talking yep. with Sean earlier today, actually. I've known Sean for many, many years. It's and great. certainly I would highly recommend the company. They, I, I know Absolutely. how much work they put into producing just a, a beautiful product. They're uh, stunning. I, I'm going to just jump back really quick. I know we've got two more talking points here, but Whitney on Facebook says, do you help coordinate the mom's dress with the family? I can. Absolutely. I Once the contract is signed and the invoice is paid, the client will automatically receive a link to either the maternity session style guide or my newborn session style guide. I have two different style guides, depending on the session that we're preparing for. And the, the clients will get that along with the link to view all of the dresses in my client closet. So I like to advise moms to choose their dress first. And oh, are you still there? Did we lose you? Uh, the lovely wonders of technology and internet connection. All right. Y'all bear with us here. Uh, I just sounded like I'm from the South. Y'all bear with us uh, here for just a second as we're waiting for Brenna. I think she froze up on us and maybe we can get her to log back in. So give us just a few minutes just to review. Oh, there she is. She's joined us. One second. Maybe not yet. To review while we're while we're waiting for Brenda to kind of reconnect here with us. Number one, as you're considering getting into a luxury market, how do you go about doing that? Number one, build a luxury client experience, considering all the touch points and how you can up the ante with each of those touch points to create a more luxurious experience. Number two, incorporate gifting. And uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, Box Fox, shopboxfox.com is a potential resource for giving gifts to your clients. Number three, start a client closet. And we mentioned websites uh, for that as well, Baltic Born, as well as Free, F-R-E-E, -E, People. And then number four, start offering albums. Kiss.us is the uh, website for Kiss. And Brenda is calling back in. Let's see if we can get her with us again. Let's see, Brenda, are you there? There you are. There we go. I keep freezing, oh man, but I'm back. You're back. Right. There's there's, there's just a little bit albums. of a delay, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just stop and let you talk, and maybe the delay will kind of catch up with us, and we won't have this disconnecting conversation. <laughs> okay. So let's right, jump let's to actually point that. number five, if we can. Yes. So the number five is start offering prints and products to your clients, and I actually do this in a really simple way. I deliver my client galleries via Pixie Set and set up a store within client galleries 
through my print lab, WHCC. So that way when clients want to purchase products, they can do that directly through their Pixie Set Gallery. They don't have to download and upload photos and take them somewhere else. And I guarantee my products. So when and they order them through their Pixie Set galleries and they don't turn out well, I will replace them free of cost. And I've never had to do that because WHCC products are amazing. Uh, but this gives your, your clients the opportunity to, uh, we want to encourage clients to print their photos and display them because what good are beautiful images when they're just tucked away on a hard drive somewhere right we want to get them printed and displayed yeah and, and I, I don't know again just i tend to play devil's advocate during my conversations with with podcast guests and i'm thinking internally okay some photographers might push back and say well yeah naturally you would offer print products and albums i already do that i don't necessarily even work with high-end client but i think i and I'm, I'm assuming here you tell me brenna but i'm assuming here what you're kind of contrasting that with is the shoot and burn approach where it's just digital files and hand it over to the client and walk away. You're talking right. about creating a more premium experience by making sure that you're intentionally including products in that process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have so many options too, right? We talked a little bit about treating your clients the way that you want to be treated or offering the products that work well for you as a business owner, right? So you can include prints in a collection or a package, for example. And so maybe you're charging 750 and it includes X number of digitals and they can buy more or it includes X number of digitals or no digitals and you can upsell digitals and other products. There are so many options for you based on the time that you want to put into it, the services that you want to provide to your clients. Sure. And, and I think taking a little bit of time to look around for those options is a great idea, but, but knowing too that you can trust the company is a really big deal and um certainly i'm a little biased but i'm going to recommend too for anybody who's shopping for albums definitely to check out kiss um for, absolutely yeah for a, a premium product and, and a good experience as well and for sure I, I know that offering prints one of the things that we missed out on as photographers when when i was shooting when i was photographing weddings there were, we kind of i don't know we, we handed off the process of print products or selling print products to our our lab they would run specials and the clients had access, friends and family could get there and order prints. Do you do any kind of IPS or are you kind of letting that process be automated through Pixie Set? Yeah, I don't do IPS. And in the beginning, I really wanted to treat my clients like I would want to be treated. I was not interested personally in doing a viewing appointment or, or, or things like that or scheduling uh, installations in the home, and we'll get to that. That's for, uh, part of point number six. But I, I want to make the products available to the client. Most of my clients don't buy products through their print shop, and that's fine. But I also have the opportunity to run sales. I'll do a Black Friday sale for client prints and products, and they'll get 30% off. Uh, right before Black Friday. And that's a, a great example to encourage clients to purchase prints. I also give them a free shipping discount on orders over $100. And I price my prints pretty comparably to regular consumer labs. You know, I want them to be attainable to clients. You don't have to mark up your prints 500%, for example, you can keep sure. them affordable because I want my clients, I want my clients to print their photos and I want their prints to look beautiful. And the only way that I can guarantee that is if they order through my lab. Well, let's go ahead and jump to point number six. I don't want to lose you in this, this last part of the conversation. <laughs> um, and let's go ahead and just take us there. What is the last kind of point principle idea that a photographer listening in or watching should consider if they're thinking about going to luxury portrait photography? Yeah, the last would definitely be in line with the product, right? So the last option is to help your client design a gallery wall, pick their frames, and even go so far as to offer the installation for them. Again, this is not something that I do. It's not, I'm not ruling it out for the future, but I don't offer it at this point. But these are things that you can pick and choose and either follow all six of them or decide what kind of time investment do you want to put in? So there are prog programs you can use to help a client design the gallery wall and, and, and even show up to their home, schedule an installation date, 
and install their artwork for them. It's completely hands off and it's taking all of the not the control, but it's taking all of that momentum and putting it into actionable steps that allows your clients to get their artwork framed and displayed. Yeah. And kind of give them the, the all inclusive experience almost a hundred percent. Because yep. as you pointed out, a lot of these hiring clients are used to things being taken care of for them. And if, if you can add that yes. as an additional service, it seems like you only further up the ante with creating this luxurious premium experience. So that, exactly. that totally makes sense. And and I also just kind of, I, I don't mean to just repeat what you're saying, but I, I like the point that you're making about considering the time component as you're deciding on the business model. This is what we were talking about earlier with time management. We, there are so many potential options when it comes to the, the yes. type of services, the number of services, products, et cetera, that we're offering. But we, if we're clear about what it is we're trying to accomplish individually and then as a business owner, then we can effectively make the decisions, filter out the stuff that's not relevant and focus on those right. activities and those elements of the service that are relevant for the sake of that business model and our goals. And exactly. um, we can make choices about what things to include, not to include more effectively that way. So I'd love that, that thought process. Yep. We made it, Brenna. We made it through and, yeah. and you didn't fall away. This is good. And there's a lot of practical information here. And I really appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody kind of joining in the conversation and and asking questions and yes. adding to the conversation that way. Brenna, before we go, just if you don't mind, reiterate for our listeners, not only where they can just find and follow you online, but if they want to learn a little bit more about this process, maybe through some of the other education that you offer, coaching that you offer, can you just give them a little bit of information about that? Yes, absolutely. So I'm most active on the gram. It's just my first and last name, Brenna Heater. I always say like a water heater makes it easy. Yep, that's it right there. Nathan pulled up my profile. And um, you can always reach out via email or shoot me an Instagram DM. I do have a Facebook page. It doesn't get as much love. Most of my uh, clients, my ideal clients, my students hang out with me on Instagram. I have Pinterest as well. And I have two, two courses available. One is focusing on mini sessions and the other is my lifestyle imposed newborn course where I teach photographers how to combine lifestyle photography and posed photography in the comfort of the client's home. So we touched on that a little bit today. And I also have a membership for photographers. It's the membership for motherhood photographers where I share behind the scenes videos every month and we do a business bonus training and coaching calls every single month for uh, photographers in that motherhood realm. Perfect. Yeah. I'm just scrolling through all this and I don't, Brenna, I don't know how in the world I hadn't followed you yet. I always, I have new guests on the podcast and I always follow them. I somehow <laughs> hadn't followed you on Instagram. So I just did that too. Aww. Beautiful feed. And, and of course we'll Thank make sure you. to link to both Instagram and your website in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But I, I really appreciate Wonderful. you making time to just come hang out, share some really practical information and advice, uh, and kind of guide our listeners a little bit in our conversation today. And thank you for being patient with my awful internet connection. <laughs> hey, we made it work. It's all good. We did. Everybody listening in, make sure that you go to bocapodcast.com. You can check out the show notes for today's episode. And uh, for those of you that are listening to the audio version, come hang out with us next time. Join the conversation. Thanks again, Brenna. Thank you.